Well, I'm Andrew. If I've there's anybody out there I haven't talked to before, uh, this is our last 1805 upgrade webinar. And today we're going to be talking about administration. So a, a wide variety of things. Um, I've got Kelly here to help me out with questions, uh, as well as our third educator, Donna, who says she's not going to talk, but we'll see what happens. I don't believe her. Hi, Andrew. How are you? <laughs> Fine. How are you? <laughs> so um, before we jump into the actual meat of the webinar, I want to just reiterate, you've probably heard this already a bunch of times. Um, our upgrades are going to start in November. They'll go throughout the month. Um, a week before you are to be upgraded, you will see in your staff client a news box appear here with a nice, easy, or hard to miss red outline that will tell you when your upgrade is going to be. It'll be on a Sunday night after 8 p.m. your local time. Um, Larry, our systems person, will put that news thing in and take care of your upgrade. All you need to do is the Monday morning after you're upgraded is to make sure you clear the cache on your browser and you should be all set to go. A couple of links. First off, on our homepage or, or on our website, I should say, you will see our 1805 upgrade notes. I'm going to put this link in the chat. This page has details of everything we talk about today, everything we've talked about in our other webinars, links to the recordings of all of our webinars, and text of all the, the questions and answers throughout those webinars. It also has a link over to the schedule of webinars, but that won't do you much good now because this is the last one. While I'm on our website, um, if you haven't had a look at it yet, we do have a new website as of, oh, I think two months ago. Um, so go have a look. It's shiny and new. We like it a lot. Uh, one of the things to be aware of here is just right on our homepage, if you scroll down a bit, you'll see, do, 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 scroll, scroll, scroll the Koha demo. So this is our demo site. You've probably seen it before. It's up on our it's linked from our site. Anybody can get into it and fiddle around. It is already on 1805. So if there's anything you want to play with or test out before your site actually goes live, do feel free to come here and use that demo site. Um, it completely resets itself every six hours. So you can do whatever you want on there. As bad as you break it, it'll, it'll fix itself. So go nuts. I suppose if you really, really break it, though, do let us know. We'll probably want to fix it earlier than six hours. Sounds like you're encouraging them, Andrew. <laughs> it's, it's a fun challenge. See if you can break it. Maybe I just like to see when things break in interesting ways. Anyway, that's a topic for another conversation. <laughs> All right. So as I said, we're going to talk about administration today. Uh, that means... Uh, sort of background stuff and system preferences and it's a wide ranging webinar. Probably some things you've seen in, in other webinars if you've come to those and some things that don't demo super well. So there, there'll be probably more in this webinar of me just telling you about stuff than, than we've had in some of our others. So let me jump over to Koha. <laughs> Bart is gonna surprise us. You're gonna surprise us with how much you can break things. I always like it. I'm not, that nice moment of like, wow, I didn't know that could do that. What a fascinating new problem. Anyway, so back on Koha. Oh, I should say, um, if you do have questions, you can put those in the chat or in the Q&A tool. I'm going to encourage you to use the Q&A tool because in the chat, it is easier than it should be to accidentally send that question just to me and Kelly so that everybody else doesn't see it. And that's not super helpful. It'll work either way, but, um, and, and there is not, you do not all have the ability to talk. So if you want to say something, you're going to have to do it in, in type. All right. So 
The first thing I want to look at in Koha is over in administration. 1805 is adding the ability to define hierarchical library groups. So this is setting up some of, or you know, all of your branches into groups that kind of act together. I will see the ways this impacts Koha a, a couple different ways. The first, the most obvious is in searching. So let me grab my OPAC. Here we go. So if you have groups set up, when you do an advanced search in your OPAC, or in the staff catalog for that matter, down here where we limit our search by location, we can still limit by individual libraries, and we can also limit by groups of libraries. So if you're a consortium of libraries and it's all individual things except for your one library that has a branch, there has two branches, those two can search together. And the setup for that is again over in administration, library groups. You can see you add a group and then add libraries to those groups. So we've created the East group and added East branch and Northeast branch. These libraries are still defined back in the, the old, the previous library tool, and, but then are set into groups here. If we wanted to add another library to that group, we would just use this add library. The other big thing that groups do, and you can see there's a note of it here, groups can also control the Netherlands would love this. Good. Yeah, we definitely have within the, the universe of Koha users, we have a lot of big, big library systems that are you know, spanning whole countries or states. or So it's, it, it's nice to have that ability to chunk things up a little more carefully. Um, so the, I was saying the other thing that this controls is the ability to see patron info. There's a permission you can set for any given user that says whether or not they can see other libraries patrons. So if I had a, an employee, a, a librarian who worked at the East branch, they would also be able to see the Northeast campus branch patrons because they're in a group, but they wouldn't be able to see the South library patrons. So new feature there. If this is something you want to use, do feel free to open up a ticket for us to help you get this set up. That's going to be a pretty common refrain through today because some of this stuff is it's a good new feature, but it's not necessarily quick or easy setup. It might you might want to hand with it. The next thing on my list, I, I really just absolutely have no way to show you, but I do want to mention it. Um, there is a new feature, a new addition to CAS authentication. If any of you are using that, that's a, a patron authentication tool that lets, this is mostly like a school library thing or an academic library thing, lets your patrons sign into Koha with the same credentials they use to sign into other parts of your school uh, online presence, whether that's your like Blackboard or Moodle or something like that. Um, if you are using this, there's, there's a new feature that allows log out from CAS to log you out of all CAS services. So if you've logged, previously if you had logged into Koha with the shared authentication, that also allowed you to be logged into say the university website or Blackboard or what have you. And then when you logged out of Koha, it left you logged into those other sites. So nice new security feature there. Logging out of Koha will now log you out of everything else that was sharing that CAS login. So again, not a thing I can easily show you, but a, a nice security thing for anybody who is using that shared CIS authentication for their patrons.
And then next up, I've got something that actually I can show you, and it's a little more exciting to look at. Um, this is the new self check-in tool. And since this is the admin module, I'm going to start with the system preferences that relate to this. So within your system preferences in circulation, you'll see a new block of self check-in module permissions. One second, I got a question from Catherine here. If the patron has their email listed on their account, my library doesn't receive over notice, overdue notices for that patron when they have overdue notices. Is there a command to correct that? Catherine, do your patrons receive notices and, and you just don't get a copy of them? Or are those notices not going out at all? So the, the, I should, I can say with, without your answer, the expected thing is that the patron will get it, but you don't necessarily get a copy of that notice. And as Christina says, there is an admin setting to make all of your notices automatically also copy to the librarian to, or to whatever email address you set there. Um, that would be one way to do that. There is also a tool over in the circulation module that will let you see all of your overdues, or we could easily write a report for that. Um, we could just so I guess my answer is there are a variety of ways to do that. You might want to open up a ticket to kind of talk through your options. That's exactly good. Yep. <laughs> okay, self check in. So, first off, big switch to turn self check in on or off. And you can see that that gives you a little URL stub there. Just like if you use the Koha self check out module, it's very similar. You need to turn it on and then take this little bit of code and add it to your OPAC URL. And that gives you the URL for the self check in tool. Also, like the self check out tool. This does require a staff member to log in to activate the self check in. So my account is a super library and I have permission to use the self check in tool. If you're already using the self check out, you probably have a special patron account for that a self checkout patron that has just permission for self checkout. You could add self check in permission to them and they'd be good to go to use here. So once my staff account is logged into self check in, uh, patrons don't need to log in themselves to do this. This is really like checking in over on the staff side. There's no, you don't need to find the patron to check the item in. It just wants an item barcode. I've got one here. Put that in and click add. So the idea here is you could put in multiple barcodes, click add after each one, and it'll build that list as you go along. And then once you've got all the items you want to check in, I'm just gonna click check in here. I'm gonna put a gobbledygook barcode in there just to show you what it does in that case. And you see it just adds another one. And I, when I say check in, it shows me this one checked in successfully. This one was not found. Please see library staff for assistance. You do not have to click finish here, but it's a good idea to, it'll time out. Eventually that was over actually right here. Self check timeout. It's set by default to timeout after two minutes. Uh, you could change that if you want to. So it will just loop back around to the start if I don't click finish here. Now be aware Self check in as it stands right now is not triggering holds or transfers. So if you use holds or transfers, this might not be a great tool for you right off the bat, but keep an eye on it. I, it that's something we're already, I should say the co community is already looking at 
for improvement. But yeah, it's a nice start here. Good for libraries that don't do a lot of holds or transfers. Probably smaller libraries. The next thing I want to show you is also on the OPAC. So let me get out of self check in. Let's just find a book. So one of the big, I guess I'm going to call it a plumbing change to sort of infrastructure things in Koha in 1805 is the ability to support uh, supplementary characters through Unicode, which is <laughs> a very technical way to say it. Koha got better at things that are not just letters. Uh, and the one big place where we're seeing that implemented already is in tags with this emoji picker to let you tag things with emojis. Um, we've talked about how those emojis work in a couple other webinars. It's not super germane here. I just want to point out that this is a new feature overall and do expect to see that in more places in Koha going forward. Koha has a new way of a new yeah, way to think about characters. And so far, this is the one place it's been implemented. Okay, my next thing is back over in the staff client, and it's one I'm really excited about. If we go to, in the system preferences, logs, Here's our old friend, the cataloging log. This has been here for, I don't know, as long as I've known Koha, but it has always had this little note advising you not to turn it on because technically speaking, every check-in or check-out edits the bib record and the item record. And for a long, long time, the cataloging log saved all of those as edits to the, to the record put them in the log, which made the log huge and unusable. And in 1805, that has been changed. All that circulation activity is now excluded from the cataloging log, making the cataloging log usable, which is great. I'm super excited about it from a, a support standpoint. Um, so now that I've got this turned on, if I go to tools, and the log viewer and tell it I want to search the catalog log and I've got a bib number here I'm going to put in object 36126 it will show me oh did I type it wrong No, okay. Let's do this differently. There we go. Made a bigger search, but this is showing me all of my changes to every bib or item in my system. So we can see that on 1023, I deleted a couple items. On same day, somebody else logged into support, modified some item records, and it shows me what those new values were each time something gets modified. So a whole bunch more reporting here. If you have a really big collection, a lot of records to be you know, changed on any given day, this might still be kind of a, a large cumbersome log, but uh, definitely for smaller collections, this is absolutely a thing you can turn on and will give you a lot more ability to see what was changed, when it was changed, and who changed it, which is really great for kind of tracking the state of your catalog and, 
and why something may have gone awry. Sarah asked, would it be best to ask us first before turning it on? I'm going to say it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> kind of, um, I have not yet heard from our system folks a good uh, kind of benchmark of, say, how many bibs in your collection is likely to kind of push this cataloging log to a point where it is going to be uh, resource intensive. So yeah, I, I would say if you're more than a single branch library, maybe give us a ticket first and just uh, let us have a look at it and see that, how likely that is to be a, an issue. Well, thank you for asking a good question. All right, next I'm gonna look at notices. So back in tools. The first thing I want to say about notices is, again, something I can't really show you, but we've had a nice new feature added to the cron job that sends your notices out. What we've added is the ability to specify in your cron job which types of notices we send. Um, and when I say type, I mean which format. So we can say, we can run email notices separately and differently from text notices. Uh, this has been something that folks have asked us about a lot. A lot of libraries want to send their overdues that go by email very, very early in the morning so that they're running while the library is not open, but they don't want to send people text messages at 3 a.m. because that tends to be a little more disruptive to people. We didn't previously have a good way to do that, but now we can set up separate cron jobs to send emails whenever we get emails, but only send text messages during sort of normal waking hours of the day. So this is something that gets set up on your, your server. It's something we'd have to set up for you, but do please let us know if that's something you want to pursue. And then for something I can show you, here in notices, we have a really good start for some exciting features. I think it's got room to grow, but we have the ability to, for the first time, see some previews of notices. So this is a question we get asked a lot. How can I see what a notice will look like without actually sending one out? So now in 18.05 for check in, check out, and hold, hold notifications we can now see a preview of that notice without actually sending one out. So I'm gonna show you on a checkout notice. So let me come down here, check out. To see that preview, I'm gonna click edit. You can see a new little box here, data for preview. And it's not super easy to see, but in gray there it says barcode, pipe, borrower number. So it wants us to give it a barcode and a borrower number with which to generate that preview. So I'm gonna go barcode 49094, pipe borrower 49. So once I have those entered there, I can come down to my email format and say, I want to generate a preview of what this notice will look like sent as an email. So it takes my barcode and my borrower number and generates, this is what my notice would look like. Um, this converted version down here, this is sort of something on the horizon. This is showing what our notice would look like if we moved from the existing markup format, the, the hungry alligators, to instead the template toolkit language, which is a relatively new thing in Koha. It's just a different way to script those notices. It's something Koha is overall moving toward. For right now, we're not gonna worry about that and instead just focus on our message preview. So again, right now this is only for check-in, check-out, and hold slip. 
more notices will be coming, but the ability to preview more notices will be coming. Yeah, so that's what Christine asked. Will it be available for other notice types later? Yeah, and absolutely, it will be, and it will be very nice when it does. Check in, check out, and hold sub. I think we're, we're simple notices to start with as a proof of concept, but yeah, there are absolutely other notices we would love to see this with, and we, we expect to in future releases. We're all excited for that moment. Yeah. All right, from here, I'm gonna jump over to reports. My personal favorite module in Koha. And we'll get to my, my, most, my personal favorite new feature too, but a couple little things first. First off, uh, you can notice this page has changed. It's kind of prettied up. We've got a, this guided reports box to make it a little easier to get straight to a saved report. So this search right here searches your saved reports. You used to have to click saved reports and then go in and do a search there. Now I can search right from here. Let's see. Holds. And it takes me into that saved reports table having already done that search. So it's letting me jump straight to that a little more quickly. Once we're in something in the reports module, you'll notice that this bar over here has been reformatted a little bit. Partially cosmetic and partially adding new content over there. It's showing more of all the things you see from here. So whenever we're somewhere else in the reports module, we're gonna have a bunch more links over here and sort of more nicely arranged to make it easier to move around within the reports module. And again, make it work more like the rest of Koha to keep that, that sidebar standard and useful as you move around. I'm gonna jump back to that saved reports page. In this great big table of saved reports, we do have a new column visibility button that lets us filter this down if we don't need to see subgroup or author. We can turn on or off whatever we wanna turn on or off there. right up with that column visibility button. We also have buttons to export this table. We can export it to Excel, CSV, we can copy it, we can print it. The reports table may not be the number one thing you're looking to export to, export to Excel or CSV in Koha, but keep an eye out for these buttons across the site. Um, they have been added in a whole bunch of places uh, for instance, I believe they are now on the patron checkout table to make it really easy to export that. So yeah, keep an eye out for those every little place, making things a little easier. Um, one more thing about this table, this JSON URL column, this actually showed up in 1711. We talked about it in that round of webinars. It is a thing that not every library needs to see. And since this is already kind of a big table, we've had a fair number of people ask us to help them hide that. That is a really easy thing to hide with uh, JavaScript. And the script to do that is over in the Koha Wiki jQuery library. So if, if you're comfortable putting stuff into the, the internet user JS system preference, you can absolutely grab that and put that into the system preference yourself or feel free to ask us to do it. I'm gonna put the oh. URL for that. Oh, okay. here. <laughs> right on it, Andrew, right on it. Who's <laughs> ready to do it for you. All right, the next thing I wanna show you in reports is in one of the canned reports, items lost. So you've probably all used this. It just it does what it says. It gives you a list of lost items. You can pick a specific lost status. And this is existing functionality. The new thing is here. So these are, again, the same buttons I was just showing you on the 
uh, saved reports table, but they give us now a way to export our list of lost items. This didn't, there didn't used to be a good way to get this report out of Koha once you had run it. But now I've got a nice little button. I can just say export to CSV and you can see it has gone ahead and saved. So I can take that and stick it in a spreadsheet or email it to somebody, whatever I need to do with it. All right, for my next thing, I'm gonna to jump to save reports again and clear out that filter. I want report 54. Okay, this one is going to excite some people and utterly baffle the rest of us. So let me edit this report. We now have the ability within Koha to reuse a, param a runtime parameter set in our report. So previously, if you had a report, like my little sample here, that needed a runtime parameter to be set twice, so in this case, I've got home branch and then home branch again, and I to make this report work correctly, I want that to be the same branch two times. Previously, I had to run that and I would get two little questions, branch and branch, and I had to pick the same thing twice or it wouldn't work. So this upgrade makes it so that, even though I've got two little runtime parameters there, when I run this, because both of my parameters are exactly the same thing, it's only going to ask me once, and then it's going to use that value in both places. And this is one of those things that I read this and I thought, I know I have had occasion where I was writing a report and this, this was an issue and that I couldn't think of good examples. Um, so it's a thing that comes up, not all the time, but it, it will definitely be an improvement in the cases where it matters. So let me jump back to edit and show you if you want something to use the same parameter twice, there's nothing special you need to do. You just, the two times you call for that parameter, you need to make sure everything within those double brackets matches up. So the same text to be displayed for when the parameter runs and then the same authorized value. If I really do want to call two separate branches there, if I don't want that to use the same parameter twice, I just need to make this descriptive text different between them. So if I go ahead and change this to pick your other branch and I save that change, now when I run the report, it's gonna ask me for two things instead of one. So it's just make that all that language match up and it will use the same parameter twice. If you have old reports where you had intended that to be the same parameter twice, those will just go ahead and work if, if you have written them so that those brackets match up. If you have old reports where you didn't intend that to use the same parameter twice, if you really do want it to ask you twice for something, um, do make sure that text differs between them. All right, I'm going to back up here to both fix that report I just edited and also show you another change. And so you, you may have noticed it uh, just a second ago when I edited this, I'm gonna take that other back out and I'm gonna save my report. So previously, previous to 1805, every time you edited a report and saved it, it would loop you around to a little page that said your report has been saved, which kind of added some extra clicks and some extra fuss. So now in 1805, when I save my report, it just brings me right back here, it just reloads this page, which makes it really easy to save your work as you're going along. If you've written part of your report and you 
you need to step away from your computer, go ahead and save it as it is. It'll leave you here. Makes it easy to still keep at these buttons here. So just a little bit ease of use there. And that brings us to the thing I'm most excited about in 1805. You may not share my excitement. I may be a weirdo, but I'm going to go back to saved reports and I'm going to find report 46. Oh, come on, you. And run. And here it is, this button right here. It's my new favorite button in Koha. So in 1805, whenever you run a report that returns a list of item numbers, it's going to give you this batch modify button. If we click the batch modify button, it takes all of the item numbers returned in our report and it pushes them over into batch item modification. It's, I'll, I'll wait while you all you know, get really excited, clap your hands and jump up and down. Um, yeah, because I mean, there is really, no, oh, Dawn raised her hand. Marcia says yay. Dawn, if that was excitement, raise your hand, that's great. If that was, I have a question, raise your hand, you should put it in chat. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're asking for item numbers in your report, it's a really fair assumption that you are doing that in order to batch modify them. So this is really saving a bunch of clicks and saves and uploads and what have you. Um, there is nothing special you need to do here. You just need to make your report give an item number, and this little button will show up. So hooray. I keep working support tickets ever since I saw this coming in 1805. I keep working support tickets where I think, man, this would be way easier for them if 1805 were here already and I could just point them at a report that had a button. So I'm looking forward to that one. It's gonna be a big quality of life improvement. Uh, for my next thing, I'm going to grab a different saved report. This is a quick change. Uh, Koha is now grabbing one little bit of information it didn't used to grab before. I go to report 59. And here's our new value, damaged on. So uh, previously, Koha was recording on lost items, it would save you know, what that lost value was and a date of when that lost value was applied, it is now doing the same thing for damaged items. So it will save a date of when your item got marked as damaged. Um, obviously this is only going to apply going forward. So after you go to 1805, anytime you mark something damaged, it'll save this damaged on date, which you can get in a report. It'll show up um, over in the items detail screen in the catalog as well. Okay, that's all of my reports excitement. My next thing is a change to patron records. Oh, let's just go to my account. Oh no, I have a fee. I owe pretend library $2. Um, <laughs> so in your patron accounts, Oftentimes you need to know the borrower number of your patron to, I don't know, do any number of things with them. Previously, this only showed here in the details tab. It has now been added to, I should say in the details tab and also up on the URL, but it has been added to this quick stat block over on the, the left side, borrower number. So that will show wherever you move around in the patron record. I 
actually, I should back up to my checkout screen because there's another thing I want to show you here. This is a, a bit on the esoteric side, but see this where it says this non-public node is now easier to hide with JavaScript. Uh, so small change to how pages are constructed. The non-public node, as it appears throughout Koha, now has a, a distinct um, CSS class which, yeah, again, is getting kind of deep into web design stuff, but makes it way easier to hide that. A lot of libraries have asked, have said that they don't really love that this shows up here in the checkout box. So it still shows there, but now if we, I don't know, I'm <laughs> gonna try to not chase this too far down the hole, but it, the page is constructed in such a way that this is much easier to hide or change or do things to specifically within the page. For my next thing, I'm actually just gonna follow my link over to this Reese Witherspoon book. And we've got a nice new bit of data in the acquisition details tab of, of every item in Koha. I should say of, of every bib if you're using acquisitions. So if you're using acquisitions, you have a tab here that tells you who you bought this from. This table has a new column for invoice. So previously we would get links to the vendor and to the basket. Now we have a link to the invoice itself so we can easily see uh, what shipment this book was received in, what other books it came in with. Sarah must do more acquisitions than I ever did. She's very excited about the, the invoice link. And it is nice. This is a sad little invoice of one. Yeah, no. just kind of making it easier to find stuff and move around. <laughs> that, that was about the report batch item modification. <laughs> that was about, <laughs> I don't think, Sarah. Yeah, she, Sarah loves invoice links. That's good. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. I think we all end up working in libraries because we get very excited about small niche information things like invoice links. Oh, I see. Second best thing ever. Got it. Yeah. Saves us three or four clicks. Three or four clicks on any given thing is, is big news over the course of a day or a week. All right. For my next thing. I don't know why this makes me nervous, but I'm going to log out. I never log out of Koha while I'm showing it to people. To show you this, not this text specifically, but the fact that it is now really easy to add text here. Uh, so there's a new system preference called staff login instructions that makes it super easy to add some text here. If there's something you want to put on your login page, like you must log in as yourself, general accounts are no longer permitted, Makes it really just simple to put in text there to, to add a message for your staff to see as they're logging into Koha. I think Chrome has my password saved wrong. Okay. Oh, oh no. See, that's why I got nervous. Because I don't trust myself to type my password correctly while people watch me. Uh, the next thing I want to show you is also a system preference. So let's jump back to admin. And I'm looking for purge suggestions. And we don't have this set here, but uh, so purge suggestions older than keep accepted or rejected purchase suggestions for a period of so many days. Um, this is something that Co has, has been able to do for a long time, but it was previously set up in a cron job. <laughs> Vicky says she just did this manually. Yeah. Um, 
So absolutely, this is a thing Koha can do automatically for you. You can say, get rid of every purchase suggestion more than two years old. And we've been able to do that, but it was a cron job, which meant if you wanted to change it, you had to talk to us and we had to go into your server and we had to change it there. So this is keeping with a general trend in Koha of moving stuff like that over into the system preferences, which is great because it makes it easier for you to change, easier for us to change for you. And, and friend, more, most importantly, to my mind, it makes it really easy to see what that value is. So if you, on any given day, you think, man, how long do I keep those system or those purchase suggestions? You can see that here. So this is similar to um, the system preferences that control long overdue lost, the long overdue lost settings. Those used to be just uh, only set in the cron job and now we've moved those over into system preferences so you can see them, you can change them. Just kind of adding transparency, which I always like. Next on my list I is, let's go back to admin. I probably should have shown you this when I was talking about library setup before. Um, libraries. So back in 1711, we added the ability to define mark organizational codes by library to say, if you look down here, my east branch, my mark org code is east, main is main. That previously was just one system preference that said that for the whole system. Now we can specify, well, I should say, in 1711, we gained the ability to specify that by library. 1805 is just doing us a nice little favor and giving it its own column in this table. So we no longer have to click into each branch to see what we set that for. So saving clicks, making information more available. The things we like to see. And speaking of making information more available, my next thing is a change to how stuff appears in the catalog. So let me do a search. And if we look at my first three results here over in the location column, you can see where these are all set to various lost and damaged status. So previously, whenever an item had a lost, damaged, or withdrawn status, this column here would only say lost, damaged, or withdrawn. It would give a generic label. It is now actually showing the specific authorized value for lost, damaged, or withdrawn that that item is set to. So Spider-Man, we can see, is actually lost and paid for. And the second one is claims return, which is a damaged status. And I don't remember off the top of my head from when I said this. I think Dusty is also a damage status. So just giving you a little more information here, a little more specificity, because it does matter if, if something is marked, you know, claims return versus lost and paid for. Kind of lets you know from here, how lost is this thing really? How damaged is this thing really? Should I spend time looking for it or is it gone? My next thing also concerns the staff catalog, but it is not something I can show you. Um, any of you who have Novelist and have set up uh, Novelist integration over on the OPAC, so you get all that good series information and read alikes and stuff on the OPAC, we now have the ability to make that work on the staff client. Uh, there was some functionality for this before to show that content, but the links didn't generate correctly. The staff client tried to give you a link over to the OPAC and everything went wonky. Um, we can now set you up so that the staff client will, will show that novelist information with workable links. Um, let us know if that is a, if you are using novelist and you want that set up, there's a little bit of information we need to get from novelist to plug into your system preferences. It's ever so slightly involved, but it works now, which is great because it's good to have that information over on the staff client as well. All 
All right, I'm going to bump back over to administration for another fun new acquisitions and accounting thing under currencies and exchange rates. I don't talk to a lot of libraries among our partners who buy things in multiple currencies, but for those that do, this is new. Currency symbol. So we can now show across Koha the symbol to go along with any given currency. So if you're looking at the price of something that is in euros, it'll be marked with a euro symbol and you'll be able to see right from there. That's euros, that's pounds, dollars. So nice little display change. And then I've got next up a few things in inventory. Tools, inventory. And the first thing we're going to do is find a barcode file. Which I didn't make one earlier. Where did it go? I saved it in my downloads. I don't know if you noticed that. This is a small but very exciting change. As soon as I uploaded a file to run inventory, it checked this box for me. Compare barcode list to results. Didn't used to check that box. But of course you want that box checked. If you're giving it a barcode file, you want it to compare to your search results. Also, once compare list to results is checked, it's going to automatically check skip items on loan. Just another, like, if you're looking at a barcode file, you don't want it to look for items that are checked out, so it's going to check that box for you automatically. Speaking of barcode files, 1805 has added a whole bunch of separators that can be used in that barcode file. So it used to support it, it used to need a barcode file that was a line break ever, after every barcode. It will now let you do a semicolon, a hyphen, a, a pipe. Um, so a lot more flexibility there, which is good kind of depending on how your barcode reader is set up or, or how you're generating that file. And then I'm going to click a couple of things here and actually do a search to show you the next thing. Before we started the webinar, I verified this. This was a small enough collection that, it would, that I wouldn't be sitting and waiting for it to run. Oh well. So in our inventory results, here we go. Previously, every one of these links used to send you off to the item record or the bib record, which it still does, but it used to take you straight to the mark view which was kind of baffling and not really what anybody wanted. So now instead it takes you to the normal view, which makes more sense. I don't know why inventory would lead to mark. Instead, inventory now just leads you to the bib record. Uh, my next thing is also in tools under patron lists. Grab one of these and add patrons to my list. So previously I wanted you to do a patron search. Uh, we can now instead just say, enter multiple card numbers boop, and scan a bunch of card numbers in there or copy paste them from a report or you know, whatever, wherever you want to get those card numbers from, it makes it way easier to just add a bunch of patrons at once. Probably not like that because I just typed those in there utter gibberish, but nice little, little new way to get patrons on there much more easily. And that is nearly the end of what I've got. 
I just have a quickly before we end a few bug fixes I want to make you aware of. The first of those is over in admin. Let's look at that system preference. Seventeen eleven added a feature block return of lost items. Goodbye. I think that's kettle. Uh, block return of lost items was new in seventeen eleven, but it didn't quite work the way we wanted it to. Um, if you had this turned on, when you tried to return a lost item, it would tell you, well, I can't check that in, it's lost, but it would mark it as found. So then you would just check, scan it again and check it in. So this is now actually, if block return of lost items is turned on, when you scan the barcode of a lost item, Koha does nothing with it. It says, I can't touch this, it is lost. So makes that way more usable. Uh, and a few things that I can't really show you easily, but I'm going to talk through them just in case this is something anybody's run into. Uh, first off, previously suggestions, patron suggestions, purchase suggestions were lost if you merged the, rec the bib record that that suggestion was tied to. The, uh, if you merge that into a new record, the purchase suggestion would be disconnected from the record. That is no longer the case. So that works now. Uh, similarly, the link between an order and a subscription in serials was lost if the order was edited, and that is no longer the case. And then finally, actually, this was not even going to apply to you. This is a change to how Koha handled migrated acquisition stuff from long, long ago. So I'm going to skip that one. And that brings me to the end of our webinar. Does anybody have any final questions? I'll just stare at the screen for a minute and wait to see if any questions appear. Assuming none, thank you all for coming. I know the admin webinar is a little bit dry and, and maybe less flashy than, than patrons or circ or stuff like that, but. Yeah, lots of good features here, including the all important batch item modification button. So yeah, thank you all. This, as I said, this is our last webinar. So you can join us in looking forward to 1805. Let us know if, you, if anything comes up um, and we'll, we'll see you in the tickets. <laughs>